Good morning, room 13. This is the last day of week one for Walk Two Moons by Sharon Creech. Let's jump right in. Today we're going to be reading chapters seven and eight. These are pretty short chapters, so make sure that you stay focused the whole time. Let's get into the reading. There is no vocabulary today. Our first focus is look for evidence that Sal's feelings have changed. Her feelings are changing. Keep an eye out for that in chapter seven and eight. Here we go. Chapter seven, Illinois. Well, looky here, Gramps shouted. The Illinois state line. He pronounced Illinois, Illinois, exactly the way everyone in By Banks, Kentucky pronounced it. And hearing that Illinois made me suddenly homesick for By Banks. What happened to Indiana? Graham said. Why, you gooseberry, Graham said. That's where we've been that past three hours, barreling through Indiana. You've been listening to the story of PB and Plum missed Indiana. Don't you remember Elkhart? We ate lunch in Elkhart. Don't you remember South Bend? You took a pee in South Bend. Why, you missed the entire Hoosier State, you gooseberry. He thought this was very funny. Just then the road curved. It actually curved. This was a shock. And off to the right was a huge jing-bang mass of water. It was as blue as the bluebells that grow behind the barn and by banks. And that water just went on and on. It was all you could see. It looked like a huge blue pasture of water. Are we at the ocean? Graham asked. We're not supposed to be passing the ocean, are we? You gooseberry, that's Lake Michigan. Gramps kissed his finger and put it against Gramps' cheek. I sure would like to put my feet in that water, Gramps said. Gramps swerved across two lanes of traffic and onto the exit ramp. And faster than you can milk a cow, we were standing barefoot in the cool water of Lake Michigan. The water splashed up on our clothes and the seagulls flew in circles overhead calling in one great chorus as if they were glad to see us. Huzzah! Huzzah! Graham said, wriggling her heels into the sand. Huzzah! Huzzah! We stopped that night on the outskirts of Chicago. I looked around at what I could see of Illinois from the Howard Johnson Motel, and it might as well have been 7,000 miles from the lake. It all looked precisely like the northern Ohio to me with its flat land and long straight roads, and I thought what a very long journey this was going to be. With the dark came the whispers. Rush, hurry, rush. That night I lay there trying to imagine Lewiston, Idaho, but my mind would not go forward to a place I had never been. Instead, I kept drip drifting back to buy banks. When my mother left for Lewiston, Idaho, that April, my first thoughts were, how could she do that? How could she do that to me? I need to stop right here and self-monitor for a minute. We listened that Sal's father really loved Sal's mother. Now we have learned that Sal's mother actually left the family. That's surprising, if I think about it. I can remember that Sal's mother was actually very sad, and she said that she could never be as good as Sal's father. I can tell that the story of why Sal's mother left is very complicated, and I'm going to have to read on to understand it. As the days went on, many things were harder and sadder, but some things were strangely easier. When my mother had been there, I was like a mirror. If she was happy, I was happy. If she was sad, I was sad. For the first few days after she left, I felt numb, non-feeling. I didn't know how to feel. I would find myself looking around for her, 
to see what I might want to feel. One day, about two weeks after she had left, I was standing against the fence watching a newborn calf wobble on its thin legs. It tripped and wobbled and swung its big head in my direction and gave me a sweet, loving look. Oh, I thought. I'm happy at this moment in time. I was surprised that I knew this all by myself, without my mother there. And that night in bed, I did not cry. I said to myself, Salamanca tree hiddle, you can be happy without her. It seemed a mean thought, and I was sorry for it, but it felt true. In the motel, as I was remembering these things, Grant came and sat on the edge of my bed. She said, Do you miss your daddy? Do you want to call him? I did miss him, and I did want to call him. But I said, No, I'm fine, really. He might think I was a goose if I had to call him already. Okay, then, Chickabitty, Graham said, and when she leaned over to kiss me, I could smell the baby powder she always used. That smell made me feel sad, but I didn't know why. The next morning, when we got lost leaving Chicago, I prayed, Please don't let us get in an accident. Please get us there on time. Gramps said, at least it's a mighty fine day for a drive. When we finally found a road heading west, we took it. Our plan was to curve across the lower part of Wisconsin, veer into Minnesota, and then barrel straight on through Minnesota, South Dakota, and Wyoming, sweep up into Montana, and cross the Rocky Mountains into Idaho. Grants figured it would take us about a day in each state, he didn't intend to stop too much until we reached South Dakota, and he was really looking forward to South Dakota. We're going to see the Badlands, he said. We're going to see the Black Hills. I didn't like the sound of either of those places, but I knew why we were going there. My mother had been there. The bus that she took out to Lewiston, Lewiston stopped in all the tourist spots. We were following along in her footsteps. Chapter 8. The Lunatic Once we were well on the road out of Illinois, Graham said, Go on with PB. What happened next? Do you want to hear about the lunatic? Goodness, Graham said. As long as it's not too bloody, that PB is just like Gloria, I swear, a lunatic. Imagine. Graham said, Did Gloria really have a hankering for me? Maybe she did, and maybe she didn't. Graham said. Well, gold dang, I was just asking. Seems to me, Graham said, you've got enough to worry about concentrating on these roads without worrying about Gloria. Gramps winked at me in the rearview mirror. I think our gooseberry is jealous, he said. I am not, Graham said. Tell me about PB, Chickabitty. I didn't want Graham and Gramps to get in a fight over Gloria so I was happy to continue telling Phoebe's story. I was at Phoebe's one Saturday morning when Mary Lou Finney called and invited us over to, to her house. Phoebe's parents were out, and Phoebe went all around the house checking to make sure that the doors and windows were locked. Her mother had already done this, but she made Phoebe promise to do it as well. Just in case, Mrs. Winterpottom had said. I was not sure just in case of what. Maybe in case someone had snuck in and opened all the windows and doors in the 15 minutes between the time she left and the time we did. You could never be too careful, Mrs. Winterbottom had said. The doorbell rang. Phoebe and I looked out the window. Standing on the porch was a young man who looked about 17 or 18. Although I am not as good at guessing people's ages as blind Mrs. Partridge's. The young man was wearing a black t-shirt and blue jeans, and his hands were stuffed into his pockets. He seemed nervous. My mother hates it when strangers come to the door, Phoebe said. She is convinced that any day one of them will burst into the house with a gun and turn out to be an escaped lunatic. Oh, honestly, Phoebe, I said. Do you want me to answer the door? Phoebe took a deep breath. We'll do it together. She opened the door and said hello in a cool voice. 
Is this 49 Gray Street? The young man said. Yes, Phoebe said. So the Winterbottoms live here? After Phoebe admitted that yes, it was the Winterbottom residence, she said, Excuse me a moment, please. And she closed the door. Sal, do you detect any signs of lunacy? There doesn't appear to be any. He could be hiding a gun. His jeans are really tight. Maybe he has a knife tucked into his socks. Phoebe could really be dramatic. He isn't wearing any socks, I said. Phoebe opened the door again. The young man said, I want to see Mrs. Winterbottom. Is she here or what? Yes, Phoebe lied. The young man looked up and down the street. His hair was curly and must, and there were bright pink circles on his cheeks. He wouldn't look us straight in the eye, but instead he kept glancing to left and right. I want to talk to her, he said. She can't come to the door right now, Phoebe said. I thought he might actually cry when Phoebe said that. He chewed on his lip and blinked three or four times quickly. I'll wait, he said. Just a minute, Phoebe said, closing the door. She pretended to look for her mother. Mom, she called. Yoo-hoo! She went upstairs, thumped loudly on the steps. Mother! Phoebe and I returned to the door. He was still standing there with his hands in his pockets, staring mournfully at Phoebe's house. That's strange, Phoebe said to him. I thought she was here, but she must have gone out. There's a whole lot other people here, though, she added quickly. Scads and scads of people, but no, Mrs. Winterbottom. Is Mrs. Winterbottom your mother? he asked. Yes, Phoebe said. Would you like me to leave a message? A little pink, the little pink circles on his cheeks became even brighter. No, he said. No, I don't think so, no. He looked up and down the street and then up at the numbers above the door. What's your name? Phoebe. He repeated her name. Phoebe Winterbottom? I thought he was going to make a joke about her name, but he didn't. He glanced at me. Are you a Winterbottom too? He asked. No, I said. I'm a visitor. And then he left. He turned around, walked slowly down the porch steps, and on down the street. He waited until he had, we had, we waited until he had turned the corner before we, he, we left. We ran all the way to Mary Lou's. Phoebe was certain that the young man was going to ambush us. Honestly, like I said, she has a vivid imagination. And that's all for today and this week. I hope you enjoyed this first week of Walk Two Moons.